what do you think it's going to take for Canadian companies to become truly representative and inclusive? Robin, why don't you start? If I had to take kind of like one of the big takeaways from our project, um, it was really trying to move past this idea of focusing at the very top because that's all I've heard recently is, you know, the la we want more women CEOs, we want more women on corporate boards. This is true. However, when we actually dug into what that meant, there were actually a whole bunch of places when you looked at their salary bands, the number of women ticked back up at the very end, right? Because that's the public facing part of the entity. But the middle is where they're stuck. They're not getting past the middle and they've not been able to get past the middle for 70 years, right? So that's what we need to get into and get into the guts of, of these places and figure out where the clogs are and, and stop focusing on the very top. There's this research that's mentioned in our first story um, that found uh, that if you were at a company, if the salary band above you, if, you're, if you had a lot of female bosses in the salary band above you, you were more likely to get promoted. So if there are fewer women, if there are not women in the salary band above you, you're less likely to be promoted. So it's a it's a it's a vicious cycle, as they would say. From a data journal, journalist perspective, definitely we want more data available that we can work with, because some of the caveats of our project came from this data transparency issue that we didn't have any uh, cities uh, in Alberta to be analyzed as part of project because they didn't disclose. Uh, like that the kind of information and we don't have Manitoba provincial government because we only have uh, like the initial of the first name and that made it impossible to marry the data with the gender probability data, right? So, and also I saw a lot of people mentioned in the comment section why you didn't include uh, the federal government analysis, this part of information just not available. So we hope that this project can, can shine some light uh, on uh, salary recorded uh, disclosure of the uh, federal government. So I believe part of the change need to have more data that we can bring this issue on more scrutiny. Why was data important to this project and how does the data differentiate this project from other stories on this topic? I think data can bring in a big picture that allows people to think about this issue beyond their personal experience. Um, and also uh, like enable us to just quantify and visualize those abstract metaphors and like where exactly is the glass ceiling, the sticky floor in each organization and data enabled us to show that uh, our data pages like, oh, like it varies a lot across entities and pillars. And now you can just show this to people instead of just still arguing like if this issue really exists. And instead, we, we can start to talk about what can we do about this issue. We've been writing about systemic discrimination in the workplace for decades. Um, is this really the moment of change for women, BIPOC, uh, and other under underrepresented groups? I think what we are trying to do here with the Power Gap series uh, is dig a little deeper because so often this discussion is focused on the lack of women on boards, the lack of women running companies and the overall wage gap. But it's really hard to fix things that are so broad, right? Because that's like, oh, women aren't doing well. Well, what do you do? It's when you can provide specific detail and get into specific entities. I think um, we need to start talking about transparency because so many women we interviewed um, said that they relied on the sunshine list to negotiate because they knew, this is particularly female leaders, they could look up what their, pre what their predecessor had made and then in the negotiation um, bring up that they knew this. That information is power. So um, transparency is going to be a big part of this. Um, the Sunshine List is obviously just focused on the public sector, uh, and we need some measure of transparency from the private sector as well. I'm not saying that every private business should be publishing the names and salaries of every single employee, but known salary bands where you can have the wage gap uh, broken down, not just by gender, but by race, uh, sexual orientation, number of employees with disabilities, like that you can actually capture a sense of what's happening in your workforce, because if you don't see it, you can't fix it. That's a great point. Um, I've 
you know, when it comes to, to banks, as uh, you know, you referenced, uh, I've, I've long argued that there should be some sort of data released about how many uh, women and other diverse candidates are in these profit and loss roles as opposed to just back office, because uh, that way you know who is being groomed for um, for success, right? You have a better sense of who's in the pipeline. You know, we often joke as journalists that we shouldn't read the comments. We shouldn't read the reader <laughs> comments on a story. Um, what kind of feedback have you received? Uh, I will say in the initial days, I was especially on Twitter, I found I was amazed at how positive the response was from from men who who realized like this is obviously a problem. This isn't about taking anyone's job away. The numbers are very clear. Women are dramatically outnumbered, outranked and out earned at almost every measure. And of the very few women who do break through, they're almost entirely white. Um, there's no disputing that. Um, one thing that I think was interesting that that we did is we included a uh, kind of a roundup of the best research that's out there about why why it is that women don't rise that gets into some of these these issues like the the mommy tax that having children can depreciate a woman's you know career earnings by something like 20% where fathers face no such penalty that women are penalized for exhibiting characteristics like confidence and ambition that are valued in men that are valued in leaders but that are viewed as negative in in women um, we talk about how women are accused of not negotiating for themselves of accepting lower starting salaries but that actually isn't the case. They do ask, they just don't get. Um, but at the end of that story, I also include details about how the current system hurts men too. That research shows that men who are in leadership and who ask for help are viewed as less confident, how men who are kind and supportive are, um, are found to make less money than their male counterparts, that the current system assumes men are less devoted to their children. Um, and this, these aren't the men that I know in my life. And so I think that that's really important to acknowledge. So there have been, a, you know, especially some comments, frankly, on our website that I noticed that I've been reading. We're never supposed to read the comments, but I've been reading the comments where there seems to be a lot of pushback about this idea of, oh, you know, here's women complaining again about about not being promoted. And it's just all about kids. And I hate to break it to you guys. It's not just all about kids. And um there was a really important Supreme Court decision uh, in the 1980s that talked about uh, pregnancy discrimination. And I'm going to butcher the quote, but the, the justices says something to the effect of children benefits all of us. Children are going to pay your taxes at your old age pension later on. Like we need society to keep having kids. And the 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 burden of perpetuating our society should not fall on one half of the population. And I think that that's something to remember as we go forward.